have three words that will get one member of our household excited. They are park, outside, or walk. Use any of those and our dog Olive will bolt to the front door, tag wagon, she is up, ready to go. And when she gets to that point, you put a leash on her, and we've got one of those retractable leashes that's got a little button so you can vary the length of it. She just gets right up against the door, and as soon as you open it, she's gone, even before it's open all the way. And she will run until she gets to where the leash runs out, and then inevitably she gets yanked back. Now as we go out into the yard with her, she strains against that leash to try to catch lizards or to chase squirrels. And if you give her a good couple of tugs, sooner or later she gets that she's choking herself and she'll kind of come back within the limits of that leash. But then you go take her for a walk, and as you take her for a walk, she gets excited, wants to go smell stuff, and you want, don't want her to run into the street, so you'll shorten the length of it a bit. And if you tug on it a few times enough, she figures out that she has to just walk next to you and she resigns herself to that space. Until she sees a squirrel or a bird, and then she starts to run off again, and then you have to yank her back. And all of this is to say that she very much lives within the limits of the leash, and the person holding the leash, and how much slack we will give her. But she's never really been able to get out and just run as far as she could possibly run. And frankly, at this point, she's been leashed up enough, I'm not sure she would go too far, because she's got a little bit of a scaredy dog in her. Not a scared cat, she's a dog. So uh, all of that is to say, she lives at the limits of that leash. And today we hear the story of Pentecost. And on Pentecost, we get the story of the church that is unleashed. Jesus tells it about it in this passage from John. He looks at Philip and the rest of them and says, how do you not have this figured out already? I am one with the Father. I am both human and divine. I am there and you all are one with me. And he's giving them this whole talk about unity and about the Spirit. He says the Spirit's going to come and teach you everything you need to know. He's talking to them about what it is that the Spirit will do. And he tells them, you will do greater works than these. If you have trouble believing me, he says to these disciples, believe in what I'm telling you. Believe what you've seen me do. And what they've seen him do is amazing. They've seen him feed huge numbers of people with a little bit of food. They've seen him still storms. They've seen him give sight to people who are blind and hearing to people who are deaf and walking to people who are lame. So in all of this conversation with them about how he is one with God and they are one with him, when he says you were going to do greater works than these, that may have sounded a bit fantastic and amazing to them. But then we get to the story of Pentecost, where to this point the disciples have really been locked up in rooms afraid. The Spirit blows in, unleashes them, and fires them up as the church. And then they go out, and they do do amazing things. They cast out demons. They heal people. They get about the work that Jesus empowered them and sent them to do through the Spirit. Many of them died for that very work, but they went into that with a new spirit of not being afraid. Just as Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. My peace I give to you. And I think this text raises a question for us today as the church. Do we still believe that we can do greater works than Jesus? Do we believe what Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will do greater works than these? And I'm not sure that we do. In fact, I think we probably live the church very much leashed rather than unleashed. Every congregation has opportunities where we see exciting possibilities of what God could be doing through us. And whenever that happens, we start to think and imagine and dream, and then we run into what? The things, the limits that we see. Somebody says, well, how are we going to pay for that? Or where are we going to get all the people to do that? How are we going to get that done when we don't have those skills? Or I don't know if we have the energy to get that done. And in that way, we start to put limits around the very passion and the very excitement that we may have the Spirit working in our lives. So as we live within those limits, though, it's not just those resources. Sometimes the limit that we have is just our own comfort because when our dog strains against that leash, when she's reaching and stretching, that can't feel very good. And when we strain against those limits, sometimes it can be a little painful and a bit of a struggle and we don't like to be in those places always. So our own comfort becomes a limit. Our fears of the uncertainty becomes a limit. We have limited imaginations about what God can do and that becomes part of that leash that holds us in as the church. And so we begin after time to see more of the limits than we do the possibilities. And when that happens, we can resign ourselves, just like our dog, to walking in that comfortable space. Now and again, something excites us, and, and we may chase after that for a moment, but then we see those limits again and get drawn back. 
So that when Jesus says you will do greater works than these, so often perhaps in the church we live more leashed up, thinking more about what's possible and what's doable and about what's comfortable rather than what it is that God might be growing us into. Now the body of Christ is the church that we are, but it's also made up of individuals. So we may be leashed as a body, but how is it that we live our lives of faith outside of this place? Because that's where we spend most of our time. How do we carry this love and grace that we've been given out into the world? And when I think about the way that we live our lives, I don't doubt that many of us feel leashed most of the time, rather than unleashed with our gifts and our passions. In little kids, we often see so much energy and excitement and wonder for the world. But all you have to do to get rid of that really is put them into a job at some point, right? Because most people that I have encountered don't just feel fully unleashed in life at their jobs. Rather you get up every day, you go to work, you do the work you have to do, you look forward to vacation, you look forward to the end of the day, and it just is this thing that you slog through each and every day. And then Sunday worship in the gathering of the church uh, starts to think of, uh, feel much like a gas station, right? So you slog through your week, you show up here to get filled up, and then go back out and slog through another week to come back and get filled up. Does that sound like fully alive, unleashed living? No, right? It sounds like we're just sort of getting by day to day to day. And yet Jesus comes and blows this, uh, this promise on the church of this spirit that will come. The spirit comes on Pentecost to unleash the church to go live and carry grace into the world. And so often both the body of the church and we as individuals live more like we are all leashed up rather than unleashed into the society in which we live to carry God's love with us. Now Jesus, when he came, he really was unleashed as a human being because he was God and human traveling in the world. But that didn't work so good. As he traveled around, people wanted to put limits on him until they finally leashed him to a cross. And then in the resurrection, he gives us this gift of new life. And it's there where these promises start to come that we will do greater works. But do we believe that we can do that? I've been on a couple of different journeys in this whole pastor thing that uh, came to mind this week. Uh, first was prayer. Uh, we pray out loud a lot as pastors, and somebody asked me once where I learned that, and I learned it the day I had to walk into a hospital room as a chaplain and say, because it was my job, would prayer be helpful? And someone actually said yes, and then I had to do it. And when I first started, my prayers sounded a lot like the ones we read in worship, because at that point in my life, that was most of the prayer that I had heard. But there was a particular family that uh, I visited with every day the whole time I was a chaplain, and I learned from them how to hear their stories and pray them back to them as a prayer. But as time went on, I got back to seminary and I ended up graduating and getting ordained. And I have to say that I'm still learning a bit about prayer. And one of the biggest challenges has been prayer with families who have a family member who is dying. Not like imminently right now dying. That prayer is a different thing. But someone who's going to be, you know, they've got a horrible illness and it doesn't seem like it's getting any better. And the doctors have given them a limited amount of time. And how do you pray in that setting? And for the Sometimes there's people that say, Pastor, we just ask that you pray that God uh, make this go quick so they can be comfortable and take it into eternal life and, and not have to suffer anymore. But often that's not the case. Often the request is pray for healing. And for the longest time I struggled with that because the limits that we have as people, the limits that we know we have in medicine, the limits of all of that would just sort of bear down on me as I was praying for a healing that I'm not sure I really expected could come. Praying for healing that I was afraid would be false hopes as opposed to some real conversation about the death that was going on. And I was like that for a long time. And some of you may have been in that same place if you had loved ones or friends that you're praying for and you're trying to figure out how to do that. And finally, one point, and I don't remember when this happened, it hit me. Why am I even doing this if I don't believe that God can make this happen? Why am I putting a leash on God rather than me feeling leash? Right? We take our own limits and we put those onto God and say, well, if I can't do this, God can't do this. And so I had this sense of putting a leash on what God was capable of. So if I'm going to pray and pray for healing, I ought to at least believe that God can make this happen. And so now when I go into those situations, it's much less about uh, what I'm concerned about in terms of what it is that they see as reality and what the limits are, but a much bigger sense of what God is capable of. Maybe God can indeed heal someone through my hands and through my prayers. Maybe God can do that through you. How many of you have tried walking on water? Right? We have the sense that we can't do that. But what if we believe that was possible? Maybe not walking on water, but going out and that God can do amazing things in and through us. The other part of my journey was, was preaching. 
For the longest time, uh, I avoided, I would, I would feel called sometimes to preach about touchy subjects, like guns in our culture, or immigration, or any of that kind of stuff that strikes us as political. And I would always talk myself away from that and say, well, I'm not sure uh, people are ready to hear that from me, or maybe Bible study is a better place to have that conversation, or maybe some one-on-one -on -one conversations with all as many people as possible rather than standing up here and talking about it. And that all changed. Here, not this Thanksgiving, but the Thanksgiving before that, when I was visiting my, uh, my brother, who lived 15 minutes away from Ferguson, Missouri. My sister-in-law had school canceled that day as a teacher because they were worried about the protests, and we sat in his living room as Ferguson was on fire, and I knew I was going to have to preach that Sunday, and I found myself wondering how I get up and, and do this at all if I'm not talking about stuff that matters. And so all of that is to say, on my own personal journey, I've had this struggle with what I believe God is capable of, and then this sort of realization that the gospel ought to matter in our lives as we go. As we think about the limits that we live in and the leashes that sort of tie us down as people and as the church, it's hard to imagine that we can do what Jesus says, which is greater works than these. Because when we think about what Jesus does, it seems beyond our ability to bring that level of healing or those miraculous feedings. But maybe we don't have to think about all that. We can believe that we can do that, but maybe we're making it too complicated. If you look around our world today, there are people walking around this community who have a different heart than the one they were born with, right? That's pretty amazing. If you were to gather all of the churches uh, in the world that feed people today, will we feed more than 5,000 people? Way more, right? So even at that kind of a practical level, if we just look and say, what is the church doing? It's spread all over the world. We do a lot. But rather, I think another starting place, too, is to look at where Jesus is and what he does. Yes, a lot of it's miraculous, but if you think about Jesus' journey, he travels around through the community, and people ask him for things. They say, Lord, I'm blind. Help me. Lord, I'm sick. Heal me. What are they asking for? They're asking for something that matters to them. And Jesus brings mercy that matters into their lives. Sometimes it's miraculous and beyond belief that we could do that. But ultimately, if you look at the core of it, Jesus goes from person to person and brings them mercy that matters to them. When Jesus says to us, you will do greater works than these, maybe it's an invitation to just go out into the world and bring mercy that matters. Believing that sometimes it will be amazing and fantastical and that we can do things beyond what we can expect, but at least trusting that bringing mercy that matters is enough to change people's lives. And we can do that collectively and as individual people of faith. Collectively, we're working on putting together a team right now to get out into our community here and just get to know the community better. Interview community leaders and school leaders and different people like that. And I think one of the questions ought to be, what matters to you that is a point of struggle in this community? When we find out what that is, what that list of things is, you can bet that God has given us some gifts and some talents and some energy that will fit right into bringing some mercy into that stuff that matters. And when we do that, we will start to feel unleashed as a church, not because we're seeing limits, but because God has grown us into the possibilities of the stuff that matters around us. Similarly, as individuals, some of you go tomorrow back to work. Some of you will go back to retirement, or you're still in retirement. Some of you will be back at school at least for a few more weeks. And every place we go as people of faith, we go with this gift we've been given of grace and love. And we can bring that into people's lives in everything that we do. Some of your jobs make that obvious. When you're teaching, uh, you're investing in people, it's easy to think about it as bringing mercy that matters into the lives of kids. I had a job once where uh, I was building a computer system to make sure beer didn't go out of stock. I had trouble seeing purpose in that, personally, uh, which is why I do this now. But, but I had people I worked with every single day who had things in their lives that were deep hurts and struggles that mattered to them. And I could go back and do that job differently now because I think I would look at the job as, yes, I have to do this thing making sure the stuff doesn't go out of stock, but how do you bring life and mercy that matters to people that are around you each and every day to listen and to love and to pray with and, and just to bring all of these aspects of faith that we've been given? That is what I think it means to be unleashed as the church. To think of it not just as something we do for a little bit together, but something that we carry with us everywhere we go. And to do that, I think Jesus has gifted us with really this grace that ought to give us a sense of wonder. Every time we open the door for that dog, Olive, 
Every time you would think it's the first time. She blows out that door the same every time. Never does she walk up there and go, oh, we're going for a walk. I guess I'll just stand here, wait till you open the door. Every time, just boom, right out the door. And it's like it's new every single day. Every time we come to these waters, every day we are washed and made new. Which means every day we are given a new opportunity to live in this sense of wonder, unleashed as the church. In this text from John, Jesus says, those who keep my commandments, those who keep my word, uh, I will be revealed to them. I don't think this means that we have to work to know Jesus or that we have somehow to earn God's love. Rather, that Jesus is all around us, inviting us into this place of, of bringing mercy that matters. And when we get unleashed, when we go out into the world and start to do those things, we discover that Jesus is all around us all the time. And when we discover that, we really will have that sense of awe and wonder each day that drives us to live unleashed, fully alive. It's as if we were to unleash my dog and she were to just start running. No, not where she's going, but enjoying every step of the way as she just soaks up life that she's been given. Amen. Amen.